the Joe Rogan experience. What are, what are the misconceptions of you? Because here's, here's the, if you go to the knee-jerk conservative reaction, you talk to people who are not interested in anyone that wants to be a democratic socialist, they hear the name Bernie Sanders, the negative implications are that you are somehow or another going to take their money, right? right? Is that annoying to you? Yes, it is. Of course it is. And also that I'm Mr. Maduro, I'm a dictator, I love dictatorships and all that stuff. And the truth is, Joe, that if you look at the issues that I campaign on and what I believe on, they are really not terribly radical. They exist in many countries all over the world. For example, just we can start on health care if you'd like. Is the idea that health care is a human right, not a privilege, a radical idea? I don't think it is. It's not. And the truth is we are the only major country on earth. Many people don't know this. We're the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a human right, and yet we end up spending almost twice as much per capita on health care. The function, and you can argue with me if you want, but the function of the current health care system is not to provide quality care to all. It is to make tens of billions of dollars in profit for the drug companies and the insurance companies. That's the function. If you go to Canada, and I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border, you have major heart surgery. You're in the hospital for a month. Do you know what the bill is when you get out? Zero. You got it. You go to any doctor you want. You don't have to take out your wallet. And yet they guarantee health care to all of their people, and they spend one half of what we spend. That's kind of what I want to do, and I don't think that that's terribly radical. We have a program now, which everybody knows. It's called Medicare. It was started by Lyndon Johnson back in 1965. It is a popular program. Uh, all that I want to do over a four-year period is to expand it. Today, eligibility age is 65. I want to take it down to 55, 45, 35, everybody over a four-year period. That's about it. And I want to expand benefits to include uh, dental care, hearing aids, and eyeglasses uh, as well. That's about it. Not too radical. Well, that doesn't sound radical at all. Now, when you say that they that Canada spends less, obviously they have less people. You mean less per capita? Yes, half per capita. Half exactly, per capita. Per capita. And, and the quality of care is as good as... Uh, or better. Do they have problems? Yeah, they have problems. Everybody has problems. But overall, the healthcare uh, experts will tell you the quality of care there is as good or better than it is in our country. So what's the hurdle? Okay, I'll tell you exactly what the hurdle is. The hurdle is exactly the same thing as in every other aspect of our lives. It's the power of money. All right, listen to this. Over the last 20 years, the drug companies alone have spent four and a half billion dollars in 20 years on lobbying and campaign contributions. That's what we're up against. The knowledge, and I mark my words, within a short period of time, you will see TV ads in California, all over this country, demonizing Bernie Sanders. He wants to do this terrible thing to you. He wants to do that. They have unbelievable amounts of money, uh, and politicians are frightened of that power. I'll give you one example. Uh, back in 2016, I got involved here in a little way with an effort on the part of the nurses to control uh, the cost of prescription drugs in California. You may recall that effort. I do. It was a ballot item in one state here in California. Do you know how much the drug companies alone spent to defeat that effort? They spent $131 million on one ballot item in one state. All right. Last year, the top 10 drug companies made $69 billion dollars. A week ago, I went to Canada with a number of Americans who are dealing with diabetes. We bought insulin in Windsor, Ontario for one-tenth the price, 10% of the price, same exact product being charged in America. So you got drug companies that are engaged in collusion and in price fixing who are incredibly greedy, and the result is many elderly people, many working people simply cannot afford the medicine they need. This is, it's unbelievable. And the reason for all of that stuff is we are the only country in the world that does not negotiate with the drug companies. They can charge you any price they want. And that has to do with the fact that we don't have a national health care program. Medicare is not negotiating, etc. Is this something that can really be implemented inside of four years? Yeah, I mean, it seems surely. like it's an enormous endeavor. Well, I want you to think back. Think back, Joe. In 1965, uh, you had Lyndon Johnson as president. And by the way, this idea of national health care this has been talked about literally since Teddy Roosevelt. This is not a new concept. Healthcare is a human right. That's what Teddy Roosevelt was talking about. That's what FDR was talking about. Harry Truman was talking about it. Kennedy was talking about it. Kennedy got killed. 
Lyndon Johnson picked up the mantle, and, and their idea was, according to people in their administration, we'll start with the elderly who are most impacted by, by health care costs and sickness. We'll start, and they did. In 1965, without the technology we have today, they implemented Medicare. 19 million people, elderly people, signed up in the first year. So if you could start a brand new program and have 19 million people sign up with a technology that is way, way behind where we are today, why can't we, over a four-year period, simply expand that program? I don't think it's such a, a, a difficult uh, operation. So when you talk about the drug companies and the lobbyists and the enormous amount of money that they spend, is this, does this exist anywhere else other than the United States, lobbyists on that level? No, no, of course not. Uh, and the reason, you know, in Canada what you have is you have a national health care program and so forth. And they sit down and, A, they negotiate with the drug companies. They have their own approach. But every other major country on earth says to the drug companies, of course you can't charge us any price you want. This is a reasonable price. Tell me what your profits are, what your expenditures are. This is a price. For us, you could walk in, you know, if you have an illness, you could walk into the pharmacy tomorrow and the price has been doubled. And you say to the pharmacist, what happened? He said, they just raised the prices. They could do it any day they want, any price they want. Now, lobbyists are, in, in general, when people talk about lobbyists, it's, a, it's a, an unattractive term. We, we think of it in terms of a negative. We don't, we don't think of, oh, thank God there's lobbyists. We, we think, wow, there's someone with enormous amounts of money using that money to gain influence on politicians, and it shapes regular people. It shapes our lives mostly in a negative way. This is the way most people look at it. I'm not saying it's correct. Why, why do we have that system in place? Like, why do we have lobbyists? Why is it legal for someone to spend exorbitant, amount of money, to, uh, exorbitant amounts of money to affect our civilization to affect the way our culture works. All right, now you're taking us into a whole new area. Yeah. All right. Let's look. All right, can I let yes. me detour and Please I'll come do. back. Please okay. do. All right. Today in America, you got three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of the American society. You don't see that on television too much, do you? No, you don't. Three people. You got the top one percent owning more wealth than the bottom ninety-two percent. Listen to this. This is a statistic we recently saw came from the Federal Reserve. Over the last 30 years, the top 1% has seen a $21 trillion increase in their wealth. The bottom half of America has seen a $900 billion decline in their wealth. So what you have in America today is a relatively small number of incredibly wealthy people. And I deal with these guys every day. People say, oh, we're talking about rich. You don't know what rich is, what multi-billion dollar operations are. Incredible power over our society. And if you were the pharmaceutical industry, and last year 10 companies made $69 billion in profit, you're sitting around right now saying, all right, that's great. How do we do better next year? What strategy do we have? We're going to put a lot of ads on. We're going to work with other companies. During the CNN debate that I participated in recently, in the debate, right in the middle of the debate, the drug companies and the insurance companies had an ad telling how bad so-called, how bad Medicare for all would be. So they, they're smart guys, and they use their power over politicians. They use their power over the media. They spend billions of dollars on advertising on media to make sure that they make as much as they can in profit. But it's not any different with Wall Street. It's not any different with the fossil fuel industry or the prison industrial complex. These guys have wealth. They have power, and they could care less about the needs of working people in this country. And that's the dynamic of American politics right now. And in our campaign, look, we're taking them all on. And I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But we are taking on all of these entities and all of their wealth and all of their power. And that's what a political revolution is about. So th the real problem seems to be that they have this strategy of unlimited growth, not that they're not providing medication that people need to save their lives. I mean, it's obviously important to have Absolutely. pharmaceutical companies. Of course, of course. It, right. So there's good that they provide, but... The business aspect of it is where the problem lies, right? Right. Look, they have great researchers, but if you check how they even spend their money, you know, they will tell you this, all of their money on research and development. We're, trying to, we're tackling cancer. We're tackling diabetes, Alzheimer's. The truth is, of course they are. But the bulk of their money is going off into what we call Me Too drugs. They make modest changes in a drug, which really doesn't improve people's well-being in order to make profits. So the answer is yes, we need obviously vigorous research and development. And by the way, your tax dollars 
all of our tax dollars often goes to that research, and we don't get the benefit of it in terms of lower prices. So it's just – it's a business model issue. It's, exactly. It's a greed issue. You got it. And how would one stop that? When you're dealing with this – the kind of influence that you're talking about with $69 billion in a year, I mean, the resources they have, how would you stop that? Well, that is kind of what we call the $64 question. Yeah. I mean, you know, all right, and, and I'll tell you what I think. This is what I believe. If you think back on American history – and you think about the real changes that have taken place in society. You think about the labor movement and, and working class people standing up and saying to their employers, we're not going to be treated like animals anymore. You can't hire and fire us. You can't work us you know, 15 hours a day. We, we, we deserve dignity. And you think about the growth of the labor movement of millions of people beginning to stand together and fight. You think about the civil rights movement, you know. And it wasn't just Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was, again, millions of African Americans and their white allies saying, we're going to end segregation and racism in this country. Think about the women's movement. A hundred years ago, women in America didn't even have the right to vote. Think about the gay rights movement. Think about the environmental movement. The only way the change takes place is when ordinary people come together and stand up and fight and say that the status quo is not working. And that's what I believe, and that's what we're trying to do. So what the, the message of our campaign is it's us, not me, because I can't do it alone. Let me be very honest with you. If I were elected president tomorrow, I can't do the things that I would like to do that I'm campaigning on unless millions of people were working with me to tell the corporate elite that they cannot get it all. 